So, yeah, I actually I overslept by a few minutes because I'm scared of my alarm clock because it's too loud. So oh, yeah. after it went off the first time, I put it under the covers. But then when it went off again, it was completely muffled. So I woke up a few <laughs> minutes later. It was just like going nuts. <laughs> oh, mine is um, uh, early in the morning by Gap Band just plays on my phone. And it That's starts with that rooster noise. Oh, okay. See, I just don't trust my phone, like, because phones always, like, decide to change something or not turn the sound on suddenly or something. So I have an alarm clock, but it's just, it's too loud. Ah, uh, okay. See, I had the opposite problem. My alarm clock's always failed <laughs> not randomly. Like, not like, I don't know if you listen to Space 1999, but uh, someone decided that they had, like, a, a hot alarm clock, like an erotic <laughs> alarm clock. <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprised I never made that movie. Erotic alarm clock. Well, it, yeah, it, why not? Yeah, okay. <laughs> that could be your sequel or something. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I do this. Welcome to Time Enough Podcast, where we are back at delving into the Twilight Zone and jumping through inter interdimensional portals to experience. The Twilight Zone in the form of a podcast, uh, and I woke up earlier than usual, so I'm going to be more incoherent. That should be fun. That's good. That's good podcasting, I guess. I don't know. This is Matt here. Andrew's back. Hi, Andrew. Hi. You know, one good thing about having rolled out of bed and uh, started podcasting is your voice will be a little bit more uh, warm and and authoritative. Oh yeah, but I, uh, earlier this week I had like allergies or something going on so i sound like barry white for a few podcasts it was great well aren't you barry white oh, no, very, very world of podcasting <laughs> I, <don't know. laughs> I like it okay anyway we're, we're, we're finally back to the twilight zone we've we've gone one step beyond now we've taken the step back from beyond into the twilight zone that's that's twilight zone it's just screwed anyway yeah yeah this episode little girl lost that's your request you've requested it yeah yeah i did um little girl lost is important um for fans of uh horror movies because although they've never explicitly credited it as such it is very clearly the inspiration for the film poltergeist which is considered a classic motion picture people still call it scary i heard someone calling that one scary just last week um, it certainly did a number on a generation of folks who saw it because it was rated PG <laughs> before the, well, it's known as one of the films that, uh, made them decide to make a rating between PG and R, but, uh, not before it ruined some folks. I went most of my life too freaked out to see it because I saw one scene when I was little, but we'll get into that if we have time. Well, I remember the thing with that was uh, the actress dying very young made the all the movies like creepier. Yeah, yeah. Actually, that, like half the cast died way too young, but not as young as she did. There, um, I have a book called Hollywood Hex, and it's about cursed movies, and uh, Poltergeist is listed among them. Right, but which one do you find scarier from 1980? That or Tourist Trap? A tour strap without question. <laughs> that was a loaded question. I knew the answer when I asked it. <laughs> yeah, that's that's in my top five all time. Uh, I'm rarely in the mood to see it. <laughs> rarely. Uh, let me go ahead and do some of the trivia for Little Girl Lost. The original air date was March 16th, 1962. Paul Stewart directed. He was a Mercury Theater guy who worked with Orson Welles. He was an associate producer for Wells' infamous War of the Worlds broadcast and featured in Wells' final film, The Other Side of the Wind, as well as playing the butler in Citizen Kane. Uh, of course, when he was that very butler, he was scored by Bernard Herrmann. Bernard Herrmann does write an original score for this episode. Um I was a little confused. It said featured, but that's that's why you saw me like trying the wiki when you came online. Uh, that's mm -hmm. talking to Andrew, not the listener, obviously. But uh, yeah, I was like trying to figure out if, if this was a uh, a committed score or not. And it is. 
Chris Miller was played by Robert Sampson. The man may not have established screen royalty, but he did sucker his way into some prime bets. What? I that what? Sorry, my my that's incoherent trivia. Okay, that's what happens when you write it late at night and wake up early in the morning. Say he's in Reanimator. <laughs> okay, there, that's good. Thank you. <laughs> um. Ruth Mommy Miller was played by Sarah Marshall. She was mostly focused on the stage and won Tony's for doing so. But as far as her film career, I didn't see much happening. Physicist Bill was played by Charlie Aidman. He was a regular as a 60s TV guest star and already showed up in the zone with And When the Sky Was Opened. He also spent a bit of time in the 80s narrating the Twilight Zone reboot TV show before being replaced by Robin Ward. Uh, I'm not sure how the split goes there, but we will get to that show eventually, I suppose. Well, yeah. I, I know. I'm sorry. I shouldn't suppose. I should know that. Okay. How are your teeth doing? They're ready. Okay. Here is a prologue for you to read. Missing one frightened little girl. Name, Bettina Miller. Description, six years of age, average height and build, light brown hair, quite pretty. Last seen being tucked into bed by her mother a few hours ago. Last heard, aye, there's the rub, as Hamlet put it. For Bettina Miller can be heard quite clearly, despite the rather curious fact that she can't be seen at all. Present location, let's say for the moment, in the twilight. Yeah. all right yeah uh you were mentioning the poltergeist thing of course um from my point of view uh like many many people i was into the simpsons i guess you were never in the simpsons because you worked sunday nights i remember that being the case but uh yeah, <laughs> yeah there's a... it's it's true but i also was just i'm just not an episodic tv person i got saturday night live and that's basically it yeah uh, anyway this was famously one of the uh halloween Twilight Zone episodes that The Simpsons did in animated form with Homer being lost in uh, the 3D world. Okay. With cheap computer animation. So uh, yeah, there's awesome. about five, maybe more Twilight Zone episodes that they've kind of done on The Simpsons. Um, but yeah, I woke up this morning just, to, I, I know Bill, the guy who comes over to check out the interdimensional hole is, is a physicist, but when I woke up this morning, I just had the episode replaying in my head, like, you know, like um, just some repairman or something. Oh, it looks like you got yourselves an interdimensional hole in the wall here. <laughs> <laughs> like uh, John Ratzenberger in the movie House. Yeah, yeah. Something like that. So, <laughs> yeah. And, um, Something that hit me with him is he's like the only person in the Twilight Zone that really that's not Well, we'll talk about if he's of the Twilight Zone later, but um. I'm assuming he's not, and he just kind of knows what he's doing, sort of, with something extremely weird, which is not a normal thing in the Twilight Zone. Well, I, um, this is one of those episodes that's better in my head than when I actually rewatch it. Um, I don't remember them saying, explaining that Bill is a physicist. There's a, there's some kind of a quick line, I think when they're on the phone, okay, uh, where he says that, so. Okay, because I I missed it this time, and I was just like, "Well, damn, he's pretty qu quick to call his physicist friend. He doesn't even like check the whole entire house for the kid before he's on the phone with this guy." <laughs> well, you know uh, what I mean. Bill he's seems like, to live a few doors down, if not next door. So, yeah, he's like, "I'm going to call Bill. This is a job for Bill." Meanwhile, I'm going to go check under the house while Bill's on his way over. I'm like, yeah, man, <laughs> he just jumps straight to <laughs> this is some kind of metaphysical occurrence. Anyway, my note is I always call it a physicist when I have problems, but uh, I guess that's why I'm going on my 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 note there. But yeah, Bill's a fully trippy dude. I, I can give him that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, he's the only actor that I really found convincing, and he had the most, like, nothing role out of everybody. You know, his 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 role was purely, like, exposition, you know? Well, if this were um, episodic and not anthology TV... He'd, he'd go to someone's house every week to solve their bizarre problem as like, you know, the the physicist of Riverdale or something. Yeah, Bill the physicist. <laughs> so <laughs> that's kind of fun. Yeah. Um I don't I don't recall ever losing my daughter in any weird situations. Um well this was 
she doesn't get lost under the bed as a regular you know (laughs) thing yeah this um richard matheson um the writer of this i think um to a point this episode is just like exactly something that happened at his house to i mean to the degree that uh the character of ruth is named after Matheson's wife and the uh character of tina is named af- after Matheson's daughter and uh the whole thing unfolds exactly like it did there where he hears her calling out in the middle of the night goes to find her can't find her and his wife can't and they realize she's has rolled under the bed up against the wall somehow but there was a frantic moment that where they're like holy crap where's the kid and of course madison's like that shall be a good idea for an episode of the twin well actually no he wrote a i guess it was a short story first but then he turned it into this but yeah to a point it really all really happened ruth was like damn you richard matheson it's happening and it's all your fault <laughs> why must you turn every single thing that happens to us into a flipping science fiction story it's like the, the I hope the, his the, wife is less annoying than the <laughs> wife in this episode. Yeah. Well, at least the wife in this episode doesn't call her husband by his full name like I just did. So <laughs> <laughs> Richard Blazowski <laughs> Blazowski Atreyu Emiliescu Ilyanovich Kubicheski Matheson. Would you please do the name again? This is a test. <laughs> Richard Atreyu Ilyanovich Rasputin Kubicheski Matheson. I think that was slightly different, but it was impressively close. I was just well, wow. have you seen Asteroid City? Yes, I not all the way. At okay, some but point you, was... you saw the annoying name game. Yeah, I did. Where I did. all the I smart did. kids are trying to remember in a very long list of random names. <laughs> it's like yeah. that's so not fun. But they are yeah, supposed I... to be the smart kids, right? It's true. I started but did not finish Asteroid okay. City. Uh, on okay. streaming. You were not into the asteroids. I'm just not a big Wes Anderson. <laughs> um yeah, so I assume in the Matheson home they they didn't actually have the uh interdimensional portal. Um <laughs> and no, but you know, this oh sorry, finish your thought. No, no, go ahead. I was just gonna say, um I know that they're kind of going for realism with this one to a degree, but I think the reason why I found this scarier than Poltergeist is because there's no real explanation for why this happens, and it kind of plays out like a nightmare. Um, parents uh, often have dreams where they can't find their child or something has happened to their child. Um, my mom had a dream uh, before I was born based on a Twilight Zone episode that she'd seen where uh, she saw a baby out on the wing of an airplane and is trying to get to it in her dream. And not long after that, uh, I was born. And so um, I think this episode, particularly just because of the lack of real detail and just how kind of basically fantastic it is. I mean, it's for what I know, the effect of them uh, at least putting hands into the other dimension was uh, just a, forced perspective with a wall you know a false wall kind of you know lit to match the other wall but actually far enough away where you can put stuff in it and i do know they shot us they did a shot with the kid going into the wall but they didn't use it i don't know if it was too upsetting or looked crappy or what yeah anyway inside there one the effect looks good for 1962 television i will give that i mean you know forced perspective works that's why you do it uh (laughs) yeah it was nice and like i said very simple like it didn't need to be this big I mean, there's there's some uh, some little dreamy kind of sounds that goes along with it, I guess, on the score. But we do get the um, the other side, which, you know, the whole yes. episode should have been filmed in trippy land. And I guess this is <laughs> as far as like set design. This is the trippiest the Twilight Zone gets. I mean, you and I often talk about the tripometer and uh, which character goes to the Twilight Zone. But I think. I think to your point, this episode, perhaps most explicitly, gets trippy as hell, and it definitely shows, it explicitly says, it's very possible that's the Twilight Zone. Um, a few times I, I've just had the thought experiment about, is there any Twilight Zone that should be in color? 
uh, which I, I think I've <laughs> on record as saying um, people are like all over would be cool in color. Uh, that oh, sequence, yeah. and that would be cool if the other dimension were in color. That would have been great because clearly um, the they did, you know, there's a lot of um, probably mirrors involved, some maybe optical printing involved. I mean, it did have like, effects. you know, traveling carnival funhouse vibes for sure. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so uh, and you don't have a real sense of um, space there as far as like the proximity. It seems like things are maybe further away than they are. They cut to the dad calling out for the kid. They cut to the kid who's in there with the dog, That which was great. The dog like, starts barking and just hops into the other dimension. <laughs> <laughs> then they hear the dog barking in the well, other it's dimension. A, the Lassie, right? So, oh, I guess so. Or new, something new like to that. Going after the kid, that's what Lassie does. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Timmy's in the well. Timmy's in the other dimension. <laughs> Did this happen on last episode? <laughs> if they Maybe did, like, it's the only last episode I want to watch. Whatever the final season is, they must have been getting that desperate. No, like, the, the 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 unaired episode of last was what they based the movie The Ring on. Yeah, I've I've <laughs> <laughs> I've never actually uh, seen last I've only seen the um, Ben Stiller show parody Manson <laughs> with uh, Bob Odenkirk. <laughs> Yeah. I have an eye of the tiger, and I don't know who to kill first. <laughs> I think in the mid '90s they did a Lassie feature film to try and kind of either hold onto the rights or restart the property. But um, yeah, Lassie had a, a uh, I think a theme song that was all whistling and a kid yelling out the dog's name. Yeah, that sounds about right. Maybe some yeah. syrupy strings too. Maybe it's something that was meant for only dogs to tolerate hearing. I don't know. Mm, that's probably the case. Anyway, yeah, uh, excite them to violence. <laughs> maybe after the maybe after the Twilight Zone, we'll cover Lassie. Yeah, let's do that. <laughs> Gee, this episode seems awfully like the last one. <laughs> <laughs> we can tell you what's not going to happen to Lassie in this episode. <laughs> so this episode of Lassie, what is it on the tripometer? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. This, is, yeah. this episode is called Mango Lassie. <laughs> okay, so where were we? Um, the, I guess the other thing that had me thinking of Bill as a repairman is just uh, him marking up on the wall, which is a nice... Yes. Uh, that's where he, I guess, shows his physicist chops, though, because he, mm -hmm. he's think This is like one of the first times we've gotten someone like really thinking about Twilight Zone weirdness like coherently and scientifically. Yes. Absolutely, yeah. He um, For those who've never seen this episode... Um, the the parents have lost the kid into the wall and uh, the dog has run in after the kid they call Bill the physicist over and Bill is able to like determine where this entryway into the fourth dimension is in a wall and then instead of drawing a like Beetlejuice style rectangle around it he goes and does X's on the points and then he makes these arcs so you can kind of it just it looks like something that would be done on a blackboard yeah and this might be my memory screwing with me but i swear there was a shot before bill shows up where they where that markings already on the wall like kind of a goof could be i mean I'm, or maybe i just missed a pattern because it's a this is like a perfect mid-century house and it has like weird angular design stuff around it too so yeah what's interesting to me is you know there's absolutely nothing has been hung on the wall in this kid's room the walls are completely bare see because at any point if you had an entry to another dimension in your wall you know because you try to put up a poster and it would go into the fourth dimension you're like damn that is the fifth thumbtack what well, seems this is a uh temporary thing as it closes yeah. and um yeah with i that... just would like it if it had already eaten part of a bunk bed or something yeah i don't know it, it's kind because of, when he comes when daddy comes back uh bill is like yeah you were like half here and half in there and i was pulling you out and we didn't see any of that you know because we only see in, inside trippy town which you know you want you want to keep your camera on trippy town while you're there but i wonder if yeah, it would have been used I mean, he just describes what happened. We didn't really see that, but I guess that's a I lot don't know. of Twilight Zones, though. That happens just for lack of the budget, the means, of special effects to do these things. But in this particular episode, I think it just helps with that kind of bad dream feeling of the whole thing. 
you know this could easily be uh you could call it what i call nightmare logic which uh, is seen a lot in like the 70s italian horror like uh, lucio fulci's movies use night what i call nightmare logic so not everything makes complete sense but yet on this one side you do have this guy who's treating it as a scientific thing and they don't have time to go through this oh, now did you check in the mailbox because she's got her head stuck in there that one <laughs> saturday evening you know they don't they don't there's not this period of time where they have to convince someone that this actually happened it's like right away must be another dimension yep other dimension let's go i guess i guess it's weird that everyone can hear her like kind of in the room so Mm -hmm. that that part is haunting and you know when i think back on the episode i don't think about the fact that the little girl's voice is done by a 32 year old that sounds nothing like a child (laughs) (laughs) you know so having this grown woman calling out daddy is a little you know whatever but um the idea of the child being somewhere where the parent cannot get to them um, is I think like a very base, basic kind of terrifying thing. Um, not just if you're a parent, but also being a child and getting separated from your parents. Yeah. Anyway, I guess I just thought it was weird that at the end it's like, oh, by the way, there was actually a whole lot more tension than you thought, but it's all over now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was this big action scene, but we kind of have to wrap it up so so Sterling can get on there and talk about cigarettes for a little while. Yeah, I did note that he might have skip that blend of 21 tobaccos would have been a good call but what can you do you know hindsight's 2020 20. might have been yeah <laughs> uh, anyway I'll, I'll read this directly from wiki although not intended by the writers the hole into the other dimension was later given as an example of a remanian cut which is a type of wormhole formed when two spaces join at the same set of points Ooh, so there is some basis for this Later, uh, let's see when the Romanian cut was theorized. Um, oh my god, there's so much math here with letters. <laughs> I don't want to know. It doesn't say anything about when this became a thing, it's just lots of M, little g, T to the power of PM. X, yeah, okay, I'm giving up on that. I mean, I gave up <laughs> on it when I first looked at it, but uh, I was gonna say I gave up on it when you mentioned that it existed, so. I feel, I don't know, well, when did people start thinking about wormholes? I don't know. Well, that's the thing, you know, science fiction sort of was very predictive of a lot of things, as we know. And so... Um, but usually it's like the Star me. Trek, like, oh, the communicator's cool, let's model, like, flip-top cell phones after that, right? Whereas, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. the laws of physics, or, or theoretical physics, is a little harder to predict. I mean, everything has to start by some wild idea, right? I mean, That's true, but I'm just saying a physicist can't first. be like, Oh, that was cool in Star Trek. Let's make that. That's let's make this law a reality. This no, law I, of I, physics. <laughs> I, I am fully admitting that this is fairly amazing. That that uh, because I I haven't read this what you're reading, and so I had no idea that this is a bit more plausible. Than, well, uh, I mean, just song. showing up in your room, but it's like the spontaneously combusting drummer or something, you know. Uh-huh. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You never know when you might just explode. Or combust. That's true. I mean, yeah. you know, it, it 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 could it could only be hoped that it happens at the most inopportune moment. Yeah, I, I guess you know, like modern... George Carlin said, "If that's not the truth, may God strike me dead." <laughs> <laughs> and, then he says, and then he says, "Let me take it one further. May God strike the audience dead." <laughs> may God strike the audience dead. <laughs> well, yeah, so say you worship the sun and pray to Joe Pesci, right? <laughs> oh my God. Joe bless you. Well, um, is it time to talk about Poltergeist? Uh, yeah, uh, let me just do one other touch. I was just thinking the modern example of this is kind of sort of the Tesseract and in Interstellar, maybe. Yes, that is a really good comparison. Yes, absolutely. I, I mean, that had the most like space and distance makes no sense. Um, mm-hmm. Of course, they had very expensive well, not completely digital. There's a fair, I guess, you know, Nolan does a fair amount that analog, but definitely a yeah. bigger budget for making that happen. Yeah, and 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 um, you know, the science also had come in such a long way since then to where they made it. You, you were just saying they're going, okay, yeah, yeah, that that happens. Well, they had um, what's his name come in to model their image of a black hole in that movie. Yes, they did. Okay, yeah, sure. Now I guess it's time to uh, talk about Poltergeist. Okay, um, 
So Matheson did work with Spielberg. And you know Spielberg came up on Twilight Zone because of... Uh, he directed one? He ended up... Yeah, he, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and then... Uh, well, that whole generation of writers and directors... He directed the first night gallery. Twilight. Yeah, that's true. So there's no way he didn't see Little Girl Lost. And there's just, you know, there's no way. But back then, I don't think it... I don't think they even cared there was so much cocaine going around to like credit anybody with anything let's but, go make popeye uh, guys... <laughs> yes i love popeye <laughs> this whole podcast could be about popeye i love that movie we, we did that podcast <laughs> yeah um that's right i think if i'm I, I lose count of how many popeye podcasts i've been on <laughs> various shows <laughs> like the popeye guy at this point but um so polar guys for those of you who have not seen it um it's about a kid that disappears into another dimension inside the family's house. And uh, the family must um, enlist the help of these uh, scientists who um, can figure out how to get her out. And one of the parents actually does have to go in and get the little girl out. So in a very boiled down way, this poltergeist is absolutely little girl loss. They just go further as the eighties did with action and effects and, uh, things like that to where it's it's considered a classic and it was definitely a groundbreaking movie for its time and yes considered cursed um and you know what else is in cursed movies the twilight zone the movie <laughs> but <laughs> not the show we're doing now reasons. yeah for no completely. no um just getting that spielberg connection in there but uh yeah so uh poltergeist the little girl that starred in it heather o'rourke ended up dying uh ended up dying of some sort of stomach related or gastrointestinal perforation something really bad after filming uh her part in the third poltergeist film and um so by the time the movie came out i think it was finished using doubles a la the crow and uh was released posthumously um what else do they blame the they blame the curse of poltergeist on the fact that actual skeletons were used in the scene where all the because the whole the whole they go so far as to explain why the house was uh had a poltergeist and why all this was occurring was because the house was built on a burial ground where the headstones were moved but the bodies were kept in the ground and so at the end of the movie they all come up and supposedly um there was a curse put on the movie because they were the actual real skeletons were used instead of fake ones but um Real skeletons were used all the time in the movies, so that wasn't actually a very big deal. And so, mm. um, no, but I, yeah, I, the uh, girl, the girl who played Heather O'Rourke's sister, um, in the in the film Dominic Dominic Dunn, um, she was strangled by her boyfriend. And I think died either before the film came out or not long after. Yeah, I'm having a look at the wiki on Poltergeist, which gets into a, a lot of who directed it, really. But uh, that, oh yeah, yeah, it's actually seem to get much into the curse. Uh, I maybe Wiki's trying to be classy today, or at least that article. No, they is. should be because the curse is complete garbage and doesn't actually exist. And this. Well, I mean, the, yeah, I mean, a, a more easy to peg curse would be the curse of say the Misfits, where they filmed on a radioactive site. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, that that's like, and this really happened, so everyone's dead. The cancer, <laughs> cancer for everyone. Let's go. Yeah, yeah. But, so, uh, but no, Toby Hooper was the director of Poltergeist. Now we're kind of getting way off, but uh, some people said he was too high to, to competently direct the film, so Spielberg directed most of it or all. But there's mm-hmm. conflicting stories about that, and probably always will be. Well, as dead. Cannabis. As I was looking at the uh, wiki, and I did not find that, but it was basically saying he was involved in pre-production, but Steven's just a guy who shows up on the set and says, you know, action and cut. <laughs> mm-hmm. So right. I don't really know what that means. That's and also, I didn't, I didn't, yeah, I didn't, well, not if you're George Lucas, apparently. <laughs> oh, my God. There's a there, there's a tangent we're not going to faster and more, more faster <laughs> and more intense. <laughs> but um, yeah, for me, Little Girl Lost, yeah, it's it's better in my mind than it is to actually watch it again. I just am so put off by, I don't like Samson's performance. I definitely don't like the way his wife is written to where she's just 
you know, you're supposed to have someone that's reasonable and then just goes batty, but she is right off the bat. I don't know if it's because they're woken up in the middle of the night by this, but she is just insufferable through the whole thing to the point where you're like, y'all, why you figure this out? Just push her into the push her into the hole in the wall just till we get it figured out. <laughs> she she I well, I wrote she may be hysterical, but she's not hysterical enough to just go through the door. <laughs> yeah, but you come on, everybody's thinking it once in a while, you know. It's like Ah, do you know how much do we really gonna miss the kid? She's like what six? She hasn't been around that long. Yeah, I mean we got some pictures. It's cool. <laughs> <laughs> this is terrible, but um, <laughs> but it's mostly yeah. I don't understand the choice of using a full grown adult, an adult sounding woman to do the voice of the lost child, particularly with how often the child's voice is heard and how like specific it is to the story and to the haunting quality of it. I wonder if they chose to use an adult because the sound of a little girl might have been actually too upsetting. That might be it because a disembodied actual little kid. Although, hey, that, is that too creepy for, you know, primetime TV? I don't know. Primetime TV can be creepy, can't it? Well, and Twilight <laughs> Zone was super creepy and didn't have a problem a lot of times using little kids for creepy stuff. So I'm yeah. not sure. But Let's there was, see. you know, there the reason why so many, like, slasher movies in the 70s and 80s had grown-ups playing teenagers is because yeah seeing kids dying not okay. for just the other reasons where adults can work longer but seeing kids actual child-aged teenagers dying on screen was considered very upsetting here i might have the reason here i i left her out of my trivia which i apparently didn't do well this week because uh there was that one thing that was completely incoherent in my trivia but <laughs> <laughs> uh, as long as it's not the math again Oh, no, it's not the math. Uh, here, let's see if I can make sense out of that again. The man may have not established screen royalty, but he but he did sucker his was into some prime bets. Yeah, okay, my brain apparently exploded. Anyway, the voice, uh, which I did not include, uh, was uh, Rhoda Williams, and she had done the voice for Disney Cinderella, so if they okay. had her in their orbit, they're like, hey, we can get the voice of Cinderella. I have her do a girl, you know, who is also not six years old. True. True. That is true. But I could just see, you know, like, oh, yeah, the, we, can, we can use the voice of Cinderella. That's great. Perfect. Yeah. Get some. I mean, I, I understand the logic. It's just that really, for the most part, is what throws me off. Uh, and Robert Sampson, I just can't shake the uh, his character from Reanimator. Hey, it says she also provided alien voices for Star Trek four and five. That's well, that's fun. cool. Yeah. Uh, and she's the teenage daughter at the Carousel of Progress. Okay. You remember the Carousel of Progress? It sounds familiar. What is the Carousel of Progress? That's at the Magic. It's now at the Magic Kingdom at Disney World, where um you're in a theater that moves around a circular building, and you see a family in different points of time. Right, but that was originally part of the imagination, or what was it? In it was originally part of the World's Fair. Then it was okay. at Disneyland, and then they moved it to Disney World. Okay. I so, would have seen it. Um, I I recently watched uh, Disney's episode on Epcot and was able to pinpoint how long, how, how, we, how soon we went as a family after it was opened. Horizons so it, or no Horizons? We were we were there bef right before that opened. I, oh, that's a we bummer. We have photos in our um, family album of not being able to go in there because it wasn't quite ready. Oh, that's too bad. I, I think that, that that that's the best ride ever, probably. A Twilight Zone ride would be fun though. It could go through like the uh, you know, one one show scene could be the weird interdimensional space at the end of this, you know, where your mm -hmm. car just starts like melting and moving in like three different directions. I just cool think it would be good to have like mechanic. a, like a you know some sort of a cafeteria like thing where you pick up your order and you have to put your hand in the other dimension to to grab it. Ooh, that'd be fun. Honestly, if you want to see something that resembles a good Twilight Zone ride, uh, there was this shortly short lived um ride, Knights in White Satin, the trip, which was the Moody Blues ride at the Hard yeah. Rock Park, and uh is it's just very twilight zone look that video up on youtube and uh, oh my gosh we're gonna have to because that's one of the last songs i would think would be made into a right of any sort. yeah you absolutely need to watch this uh oh as, and I, I would 
and tell the listener in the, the video, um, it's made by the company that made the ride. And it shows like uh-huh. this really like kind of yuppie looking family getting on the ride, <laughs> like with like some nice flute music playing in the background. And then the ride's just like balls trippy. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, yeah, everyone looked that up. Yep. Okay. Uh, anyway, let's, let's get back to Little Girl Lost. We'll do the, okay. the questions that I have. Um, Okay. In this episode, who went into the Twilight Zone, if anybody? Um, well, everybody that went into the fourth dimension went into the Twilight Zone. Yeah, I was going to say, first the girl did, then then the dog did, then the, the dude did. The dad. Well, and it's because Serling says uh, he's got something at the end where it's just like this whole thing. Maybe they'll have a little bit more respect for the flipping Twilight Zone. They didn't know it was there. <laughs> When they yeah. bought the house, they weren't. Well, maybe they did tell them about it when they bought the house, and they just didn't care. Uh, yeah. so you guys, yeah, it's a, it's a real nice mid-century house. I guess you wouldn't say that 1960, but oh, by the way, don't don't put anything on that wall. Uh, it's an area. It's <laughs> yeah. got a hole. They always rush the dimension. closing, especially on if there's a entrance to another dimension in the house. They really rush the closing. <laughs> so, I guess this is the episode where the Twilight Zone actually becomes like a literal place. That's what I was saying earlier. Absolutely. Yeah. Cause I, can you think of another episode uh, up to this point, at least, that does that? No, it's all like theoretical. It's all just like, I mean, even when someone goes to like a weird place, that was never the, ob- it was the obvious choice, but we, I think every, in every instance, decided that was not actually the Twilight Zone. You open a door into another dimension. It's right there on the wall. <laughs> That's kind of where this one <laughs> is, you know? You're traveling to pretty much the other side of the room <laughs> which does make it a little more disturbing when you can just choose to stroll into a twilight zone or choose not to stroll into a twilight zone i mean this is great the great example of just using a very meager budget to make a very effective piece and uh that bernard herman music whatever things that i felt might have been shortcomings that the score just really punches through. yeah you just, you, you you would have been the like to have been the casting director here is what you're saying I mean, we we would. She she played Cinderella. <laughs> like, I don't care. I don't care. That was already like ten years ago. Could what if please? they got? What if they got Snow White? That I think Snow White's supposed to be a little bit younger. The actress that did it sound a little more girly, and she would have been a little older by this point. <laughs> I, I, I think they should have just at a certain point had Grandma go into the other dimension. Oh no! I was about to say, what, no, Grandma's doing the voice of the little girl. <laughs> Daddy. Daddy. <laughs> I hear the an elderly voice of my daughter. <laughs> I actually got she, thrown off like in Japan and she's like Papa, which uh, is always what my daughter has said or whatever. But we were at a restaurant a few weeks ago and she was like, actually, that's when I was with my parents. And, and she was like, Dad, who did that painting on the wall? And I'm like, Dad, who's who's Dad? Who's that? <laughs> like, I got confused being called Dad because it's I just haven't yeah. had that happen. So, yeah, you're gonna ask about the triple meter next. No, I'm not. I'm gonna ask if anyone in this deserves their trip into the literal Twilight Zone. Right. Um, I think the people that deserve to go didn't. Well, he uh, the the dog and the dad very much chose to enter the twilight zone, so they deserve yeah. it. Uh, oh, the, the dog definitely then complete idiot. The girl should get rails on her bed. Yeah, they sell those where they, it's it's like it's mm-hmm. not like a crib. It's just like you know, it's like a, you put a rail on the bed and then the kid doesn't fall out. Yeah, but this kid would get its head stuck through it. I feel like <laughs> this is probably not the first time things have happened. It's like, hey, her head's caught in the rail. Good, she can't get through to the fourth dimension at my parents church when i was growing up kids would regularly get their heads stuck in the balcony railing that was exciting sometimes oh, in the middle great. of a church service <laughs> so their body was like dangling over the side and it was only held in midair by their head oh no that would have been more awesome though they were in the in the balcony with their head stuck in but you know it's Good. in well, a service and so there's like a, to pay attention it's like a hundred people or more there to see the kid do it <laughs> i would then go they, to church just to see that happen then they have to stop service to get the kids head out or whatever yeah yeah i get this making Can't church fun again yeah <laughs> i was gonna say at least something <laughs> happened i'll stay awake um 
but yeah, you if you if you decide to go through, which they do point out that the dog made the decision as well, and and the way that mm-hmm. dogs make decisions, I guess. So, mm-hmm. yeah, absolutely. No, the um, dog was, you know, just hoping there was some sort of uh, meat product, be it human or otherwise. Right, right. They have doggy treats in the Twilight Zone. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, yeah. We can trip a meter it. What's what's your rating for this one? Is it one it's to five? Trippy rating. Yeah, or zero to five. You can get a zero if you want. Zero to five. No. Um, it has to be five. Those scenes of the fourth dimension, you know, they could have shown they could have decided not to show it. I think in Poltergeist it was like this spinning tunnel of light or something, or you know what I mean? Some something more ethereal. But this was just straight up like banana time. Like you said, mm-hmm. funhouse mirror. A great way to describe it. When someone is shown losing their mind, uh, this is the kind of thing in old movies. This is the kind of thing they would mm-hmm. do. They would be these, you know, camera effects and things like this. So is it Hitch- Hitchcock Spellbound has that stuff? I think that's kind of fun. It does. This is, of course, this of course. I I think just they went for broke, um, just because it had to be the the polar opposite of what people were seeing inside of the house. Right, right. And you want to give them something because you're definitely not giving them the kid going through the wall or what they say, the guy being dramatically pulled from the wall. They can't have that. So, yeah, at least give them some trippy things. So I think it being upside down and wiggly looking and kind of like on another planet. Yeah, to me, that's that's a five. I'm going to hold back just a bit and give it a four point five. Um okay. One, because in this, the Twilight Zone is almost like a literal physical place, which uh-huh. While that place is extremely trippy, I mean, I'm not pulling too much back on the tripometer, but um, right. it's it's a place you can just walk in and hopefully out of. Uh, so oh, it, no, it's true. I mean, people do go in and out of it, and so I think maybe maybe I should do four point point five, just because a five would be you just don't return from it. Well, that's what I was going. To, I was going to throw your own past words back at you and uh, say. I, I think you had noted that it's really the trippiest is when you can't see how the characters will continue after the episode. Whereas this, eh, they're going to go back to bed and tell her it was a dream the next morning. And uh, was that it, was that the triple meter or was that me determining who went? Uh, that it might be that, but in in any case, I mean, you know, the Twilight Zone when it has that element that you don't know how these people continue makes it the weirdest. Whereas they're going to tell her it's a dream and she'll probably get over it. Um, I'm one of my other podcasts. We just did the the movie, uh, Santo and blue demon versus Dracula and the Wolfman. Sorry. It's a long title. Anyway. Right, right. Yeah. At the end of the movie, it's like, um, yeah, we're just going to tell the girl all that stuff was a dream. It's like, then how are you going to explain the fact that her mother and grandfather are now dead? <laughs> <laughs> But it was, we'll just tell her to dream. Ah, oh, great movie over. Yeah, you dreamed them dead, and now they are a good job. <laughs> it's your fault. It's not your it's, fault. It's like not, everything else, it's not Dracula and the Wolfman's fault. It's your fault. It's just the Wolfman. It's not. It's not Richard Dracula and Marvin Wolfman. <laughs> well, in that movie, it basically is Marvin Wolfman. He goes around through half the movie in a turtleneck, you know, with a hippie necklace and a in one of those. Uh, you know, white guy froze or something. <laughs> yeah, no, I've not watched it, but I have a book with some stills from it in there, so I'm familiar with this image you're describing. You should watch it, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> that didn't make me want to watch it. <laughs> oh, you should watch it. It's good. <laughs> okay. You watch okay. that after the I'm... Nights in White Satin, the trip. <laughs> I'm definitely watching that before I go to the movies. I'm definitely. Yeah, I'll get you. I'll get you a link that. for that. Yeah, you don't Please have time do. for Santo, but. No, but I have some Santa that I could throw on. Yeah, so there you it go. might be in the it might be in this the pack of Santo movies. I just don't know it. I, I do get what you're saying with this episode, though. Like talking about it's shame. It's got all the that stuff, you know. Um, but yeah, watching it, it's slightly underwhelming. Yeah, no, it is, and that's fine though with Twilight Zone. You know, um, the fact that they do linger, any of them, is is like a characteristic of the twilight zone i mean as weird as it is i guess yeah ha, you know 80 percent of the episode is just in this kind of bland looking bedroom it's not like she had interesting designs in there or anything no it's but you know also we have to take into account that um because it starts off so realistic and so relatable 
that um, you put yourself in the position of someone who'd never seen anything presented like this dramatically. And I am sure there were people that were traumatized by it. Yeah, it's probably a little more mind blowing in 1962 rather than when we uh, watch our favorite Marvel superheroes go through 87 portals within one minute, you know, <laughs> that's true. Or, or, you know, just pre poltergeist versus after poltergeist. Well, it could get a lot worse. The tree could like pull the kid through the window. Yeah, like, yeah, it's like, this is interesting. It's like the inspiration for something like Poltergeist. I was yeah. about to say it was like La Jete, like in 12 Monkeys, but I was like, well, La Jete is kind of better in 12 Monkeys in many ways. No. So actually, so that's actually a bad uh, <laughs> comparison. Yeah, no, I think at, at some point we we may have did a podcast about La Jete. I feel like yes, I we did. We that. did that too. That also happened. Yes. Okay. Because <laughs> right. I've always, I've, as soon as I saw La Jete, it was released on VHS when 12 monkeys was in theaters and we we're like, Whoa, I wish I just would have watched this. I do have a lot of dog notes here. How much is that doggy in that other dimension? Uh, <laughs> you didn't send me the notes. Did you? That damn barking's never going to stop. No, I'm sorry. I forgot. Like I said, I kind of uh, did it late at night, went to bed, woke okay. up talking to you. So uh, you somewhere there, I missed the, uh, the sending of the notes. <laughs> All right. I would have remembered that. <laughs> the dog notes. Um, I guess we'll wrap it up then. What's up in, in your gonzo world? I, I guess the film festival has just ended in our timeline. Yeah, November the 17th and 18th. Uh, yeah, this is the, the 19th. Uh, so <laughs> The 19th, um, we we're having a YouTube live stream, which is uh, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on the Gonzorific YouTube channel. Uh, there's a link at gonzorific.com. But, you know, of course, if you missed that, you missed that. You probably so, did, to be honest. <laughs> that's fine. It was um, wonderful not seeing you there. Okay. Hey, step it. A listener was there. <laughs> Maybe two. I'm sure. Somebody was. Yeah. Yeah. Your your uh, part of your new music was used in a film called Red Tea, and uh, I will be happy to share that clip with you. Groove. Um. Yeah. I never plug my music. I'll do that today. I make music. That it's at roving sage media dot bandcamp dot com i make lots of different sorts of sounds so there's some ambient stuff there's some psychedelic rock there's some folky stuff uh that's what i do with my time when i'm not podcasting so It'd that, be great if it was dot comages that would be great yeah my grandfather no no my aunt, my uncle also went by doc doc comages that's close enough that's super close. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Okay. Um, also, you can support this podcast on Patreon at Podcastio Podcastius, but I don't think I'll sit here and list everything today because I just yeah, listen it. to one of the previous episodes if you want to hear all that. Right. I want. I, I think people should only have to hit the uh, thirty seconds forward button like once. That's nice. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Okay. Uh, have you checked your walls for interdimensional holes then man there's probably a cat that i was watching for someone that's still in there somewhere so you're not a good cat sitter is what you're saying no i mean i sat on it it didn't like it so i'm like okay. apparently i'm no good at this <laughs> oh no that's a weird way to cut it but i'm gonna cut it there i'm fine yeah uh, well, thanks for on. getting up extra early, man. I mean, the thing this. is, I'm, I usually get up at like seven or shortly thereafter. It's just sometimes I don't. So in that case, I have to do the alarm. But okay, because I'm typically up. Yeah, so it's just a, a slight. Mostly, it was the, the the problem is I'm scared of my alarm clock. That's the biggest problem. <laughs> I've never heard someone say that before. Yeah, I I know people put theirs. I know people who put theirs on the other side of the room. Well, so I don't want to do that. Away. No, no. I want to hit the snooze button a few times. Oh, gosh. Although I, I shouldn't this. put it under like three layers of covers because then it can't <laughs> be heard anymore. That was the that was the flaw in the, my plan. <laughs> oh, man. OK, well, we got it. So how close are you to the end of season three then at this point? Uh, <clears throat> I mean, this this episode's kind of way in there. I think there's still like 10 episodes to go, to be honest. Uh, let me see if your name's on any of them.
I found it. Yay. They weren't in order or anything like that. Uh, there are still one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There's still like 11 episodes. And it looks like you've chosen to um, traumatize yourself because your name is on the dummy. Oh, <laughs> of course I picked the dummy. <laughs> I was flipping through the Twilight Zone companion uh, not long ago looking for something. And uh, the page with the dummy on it was there and i was like oh god that thing is hideous so of, okay. course I, of course of course you said that <laughs> like that time you chose after hours oh, god. <laughs> that one's just all i'm just i don't know what's my deal i've i mean i i actually did watch poltergeist uh and serbian film within the last i don't know four months hey facebook gives you a preview again for your link how exciting it just seems to be kind of arbitrary. Because, like, for a year it wouldn't, you know? It would, no, I remember. Link and, yeah. But now you get a little picture again. So, uh, who knows? So, yeah, Knights and White sat in the trip by uh, Sally Dark Rides. Um, and we, we, like, they did not promote this place. It opened and closed, I guess, in 2008. Maybe it made a little bit into 2009, but uh, it was like near Myrtle Beach. Right, laundering they, money. They had the Led Zeppelin roller coaster. Uh, <laughs> and uh yeah it was open for six months and they didn't have, they've spent all the money making apparently and didn't have any money for marketing so nobody came and then it closed around and reopened with all of the uh ip gone like they like uh, and so it was like lame at that point <laughs> <laughs> and then it closed after about three months of that so yeah look up the hard rock park sometime it's uh yeah. it was okay. A debacle, like, but had a couple of like rides that were insane. <laughs> yeah, they probably ch changed the name to Tax Right Off Land. Yeah, yeah, I don't know what it is <laughs> now. So, but uh, yeah, if you like esoteric, uh, bombed out theme park. Oh, I lore, do. God, yeah, that's my jam. Okay, that you. I mean, that has the uh, people, the urban explorers, going into the abandoned hard rock park on youtube i love those stuff. things i do i totally watch those videos okay then there's there's a whole rabbit hole you can go down with that park if you feel like I it i can't wait because you know cinemarty croft world is always a little bit depressing because there's not that much evidence of it yeah but that stuff is super interesting to me as well whatever they do find you know I oh like yeah yeah i lap that up i'm just saying like with hard rock park there's I think there's even a few YouTube videos from like when it was actually open, so you can run the gamut of uh of what's there. Oh, okay, yeah, because okay. it was open in 2008, so people were making videos. Yeah, no, I that's I want to get one that. from now where people are going through the hulking wreck of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I'm I'm interested in the fact that it existed. I'm gonna want to see like what it looked like when it was doing what it was supposed to do. Right. Right. Yeah, that's how in the video I sent is uh, made by the company that made the ride. So obviously, yeah, that's it's looking, that's what I'm uh, that's what I want to see up top at least. It's squeaky best, yeah. Ooh. Okay, let me hit the record.